And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, one half of the double-headed monster that is Underground Oracle Publishing, for the longest time do who had done 5e material, now venturing into the wacky and wonderful world of the Cypher system with Harrow the Blighted Plane. The one the one and only, don't give her a penny for your thoughts, but she is Jess Pendley. How you doing tonight? Hey, I'm, I'm stoked about this. This is awesome. <laughs> I had... I tried to I try to go I tried to do my own thing when it comes to the when it comes to the intros without um doing something that's gonna get me sued by the buffer family. <laughs> I like it, it sets the energy. Mm -hmm. Gets the gets the moving. Yeah. So I'd like to open with the humble beginnings. So walk me through your first introduction to role playing and what made it stick. Uh well my I started playing in uh, the early days of 3.5. Um, that's kind of was my introduction to the system. Um, I always, you know, I grew up very rural and pretty poor, so we had to lean on our imagination for a lot of stuff anyway. Um, so when I first kind of cracked open that um, third edition player's handbook and read what it was all about, it just, like, it absolutely captured my imagination, because not only did it, that the the three, the third edition player's handbook was uh, gorgeously illustrated, and that really caught my attention, but also, you know, I, I could see that you, you could kind of put yourself in these stories, uh, and I was always reading, and so this is kind of felt like an evolution of losing yourself in those books, even better, because, you know, you, you get to create the story yourself as you go along, um, mm -hmm. is what I got from it. So that was kind of my my introduction to the hobby was reading the third edition player's handbook and then just kind of obsessing over it for two years before I was finally old enough to have friends that could drive me to the nearest city with a game shop where I started role playing. Um, and then once I once I started doing it, I was hooked. It was just my favorite way to to spend time. Mm-hmm. And. Would you would you say that throughout throughout most of throughout most of the time you were mo you were mostly a D and D gal? Uh, yeah. Um, I played with other systems. We played a lot of mutants and masterminds. Um, back in the day, um, loved that. I really liked the World of Darkness books. Um, I probably read them more than I actually played them. Um, but really was into that. But as far as like. I spent the most hours in in D and D for sure. Um, e either playing three point five or our own homebrewed, heavily heavily homebrewed version of you know three point five in between editions. But um, yeah, I would definitely have spent the most time in D and D as a system for sure. Yeah, which is is understandable. And although um, if I wanted to be, if I wanted to be really pedantic, I'd say that the only thing mutants are master. That mutants and masterminds is more pure D twenty than e than even D and D was because well yeah. it's the only that D twenty is the only thing you're rolling. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it it is funny you bring you bring up um, mutants and masterminds given some news that dropped on my, that dropped in my lap about two days ago. That is that um, valiant is valiant is doing another crack at. Um, at ta at tabletop, thanks to Green Ronin, which means we're getting Valiant Mutants and Masterminds. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so, for, so for me, it's a case of all right. How long is it going to take before they make before they put out a Unity book? <laughs> although, as a historian, Val Valiant is an in is a interesting beast. It's it was it was it was kind it was kind of the the hidden the hidden gem when it came to those indie companies that were cropping up in the nineties. Yeah. And a lot a lot of names that are household names ended up um ended up getting their start there. And Joe Quesada had spent a cup of coffee there too. Not exact a household name for sure, but not exactly for the right reasons. <laughs> uh, that had kind of a resurgence like uh mid two thousands too, didn't they? Like I thought they kinda of popped back up for a while. They did for they did for a bit, and they've had some interesting ideas. Um, yeah, 
there there wasn't there there obviously was that was the attempt to try and jump on the whole the whole superhero movie thing with bloodshot but that didn't unfor- go well. unfortunately they had Vin Diesel doing it <laughs> when there was when there was a um web thing that they had done on their on their YouTube page that had um Jason David Frank playing bloodshot which honestly he did a better job <laughs> um, it, it was meant to pro- it was meant to promote the return of Ninjak, uh, and of course the of course for a lot of people their their introduction to Valiant was the worst Iron Man game ever made, <laughs> um, Iron Man and Exo Man of War in Heavy Metal, which is abso- which tends to be high up on those list of worst PS One games. Yeah, I have, I did not play that one. I'm going to be honest. I miss that entirely. I was never a big Exo Man of War fan, though, or a big Iron Man fan, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, admittedly, not, that was the, not my cup of tea. But the, uh... the concept of Exo Man of War is is interesting. You know, instead of a rich guy getting a suit, you have a Roman era barbarian getting a hold of an alien suit. But yeah. So, t- obviously, obviously, this is. As I understand it, and I could I could be I could be wrong, but this is your first this is going to be your first venture outside of what I call the D twenty bubble, using the cipher system. Um, was Harold yeah. originally going originally going to be a cipher system project, or was that something that pivoted to that after certain incidents, which we all know about? <laughs> so to be so all of our all of our we're we're world creators, so we we've had this stuff hanging around for well over a decade. Most of these things, in one form or another, they've been they've been around. So like Haro started out as something entirely different than it is today, like 15 years ago, um, mm-hmm. and it's gone through a lot of you know evolutions since then. Uh, we did not plan to release it for the Cipher system because, frankly, we didn't we didn't plan to be releasing outside of 5e for a while. Like we had plans to do conversions of things um, in the future. But we kind of just always thought the 5e would be kind of our home base um, because we'd already established a community there. We had already put out a bunch of products for it. So we were like, you know, this is this is what we're going to be. Um, but um, so Haro originally came out as a as a micro setting that was meant to be just a a plane that you could travel into um, on your during your D&D adventures. Like part of the thing that we really like to fuck around with in our own fantasy world is the concept of pocket planes and like the cosmology of the fantasy world that is we would consider our core fantasy world is, is, is very big and very full of all these like strange places that you can go to. And Haro was one of those planes that you could find yourself on um, in your travels. Um, and so we released a it, just like a 12 page supplement as just kind of like a little addition that you could slot in your 5e campaigns a few years back. Um, and we always planned on doing something bigger with it. Definitely. Um, because we love the world, uh, it was something that we wanted to really dive into. But we thought we would probably be fleshing it out in in the way that we had presented it, which was, you know, maybe do a big book of planes and like dive a little deeper into it, but definitely not flush it out in the way that we've done now, um, and present it to people. When we uh, decided to pivot to the cipher system, it was such a big change for us um, in the way that we planned on producing things. Because up to that point, we'd really been producing. We, we would. We were supplement creators. Um, we we dropped into the 5e scene, and we were creating things that, while we put as much of our lore and stuff in it as we possibly could, because we're very into that n- nerdy end of shit, um, we definitely wanted to make it so that you could slot it into your own world, so that we weren't forcing people to try to jump into our campaign rather than playing the world that they're used to, they're accustomed to. We would design things that you could use to, you know, to expand and supplement your own stuff. Um, so when we decided that we were going to make this really abrupt change, we decided that we were going to kind of really abruptly change our publishing model as well. And so instead of continuing to produce these small bite supplemental materials, we wanted to put out settings. And then in the future going forward, if we're producing supplements, it's for the settings that we've already created. So we kind of went through our catalog of what we have, uh, at home and we're like, you know, what's the first setting that we want to drop? Um, and we didn't want to do our core fantasy world because um, everybody has 
a high fantasy campaign setting that, you know, they love already. And we didn't think that that would, like, kind of be the most exciting thing, possibly the most attention-grabbing thing. Um, and we love all of our worlds, so we had a lot to choose from. And Haro felt like the right play because it is still fantasy, so it's going to feel familiar to people who had been supporting us after that point. Mm -hmm. But it's got that kind of strange bent to it, and it's got a lot of really cool qualities that um, new Cypher, or that Cypher people would also be drawn to because of the way that Cypher system games are often designed. Um, it really complemented the, the new system. So we just dug into Haro and decided to put that out in front of people. Um, and we're super excited with how, what it's turned into and what we're going to be putting out. It's pretty great. But yeah, originally it would have been 5e. All of our stuff would have probably remained 5e for quite a while. But um, now it's not. And to be quite honest, it's kind of it's, it's refreshing. It's a new part of the community. It kind of forced us to get out of um, a comfortable position that we were in, try some new stuff. And to really, like, expand in the way that we had wanted to, but you're kind of afraid to when you've got, like, when, you, when, when you're in an okay position, sometimes you're afraid to, like, really alter things because you're like, oh, I'll lose all this really hard work that I just did. And so we felt like we were kind of on a ledge anyway, and it was like, well, we're being forced to jump, so we might as well, you know, we might as well try to land on something fucking awesome. So that's what we decided to do. Yeah. Um Speaking of that, of, of all the systems you guys could have jumped to, what made you go with Cypher? We got that one a lot because, um, well, either because people hadn't really heard that much about it or because it's not... A lot of people went from D&D &D to Pathfinder. Um, well, in my case, the, re the reason why I ask is I've obviously, I'm obviously familiar with um, Cypher. I've run, Num yeah. I've run Numenera and The Strange a bunch of times as, as, well, as, as well as dipped into stuff in, in um, Cypher. But it's more of it's more of I, I wanted to see the method behind the madness. Yeah, um, for us it was because I had had the cipher system rule book for a while, um, even though we rarely had time to um, like create for other systems. Never had time to create for other systems. Um, I have a, a lot of rule books that I like to go through. Just to, you know, as a designer, I think it's important to read things and determine why you don't like them or you do like them, and it's just fun to look at them. You know, it's my it's my fucking thing. But um, I had the Cypher System rulebook for a while, and I really, really fell in love with that book. Not because um, I thought it was necessarily the easiest point of entry for like n new role players or anything like that, but because it was just like this big beautiful toolbox that kind of explain to you how to create in their system like it's in the bones of cypher getting you to create for it so as a designer i absolutely loved it mm -hmm. um as as our method of design leans it fit us perfectly because we are always we, we call ourselves lore first producers like story is super important to us we like to tie everything together and um, we like mm -hmm. to put it in if you, if you find a magic item, there's a story that connects it to something somewhere else in the world. Whether you see it or not, we know those threads are there. They're connected to something. Um, and when I read Cypher, it was clearly a more narrative first system than D&D &D is natively even. Um, but it still had the mechanical structure that I like to play around with and that I like to be in. That a lot of more story-driven tabletop RPGs don't have the same sort of mechanical structure that I like. Mm -hmm. um, they feel a little too loose for me. So Cypher kind of landed right in that sweet spot of having yeah, enough mechanics that you could get crunchy if you wanted to, you could tool around with stuff, but it was also clearly narrative first, which was super important. And um, it's also universal, which we have a lot of crazy ideas for different worlds that are drastically different genres and themes and tones, and it would have been us kind of doing a backbend to do all those things in a lot of other systems. But with Cypher, you don't really have to compromise in that way, because... It really is super universal in a way that a, a lot of the systems that people know about aren't. Yeah, and there there are a few there are a few interesting things you t you touch upon with that. One of the one of them being, um, just on just on the universal thing, the big lie that ev that so many, um, so many five E adherents consistently end up saying, and this is this <laughs> is not some I don't I'm not picking on five E specifically with this. This is a problem I've seen for years yeah this idea of oh you can you can run you can run any kind of fantasy with with just d with just D. &D. i know it'd be tempting to say that i'm picking on 5e again with with this but i'm not i saw this 
I saw this with 3.5. I've seen this with Pathfinder. I saw this with AD&D. The problem is that's not the case because yeah. D&D and, 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 and to a much lesser degree Pathfinder have had this problem for years of shit or get off the pot regarding what kind of fantasy you are. Because <laughs> uh, the, the counter-argument I've, I've often used is, okay, the, the most common way to equip a fighter is good old sword and board. You know, a bastard sword and a large shield. How are you going to how are you going to how are you going to do that if you're running say a samurai themed campaign where shields are not really going to be a thing? Yeah. Oh. And I, I think it's I think a lot of it has to do with just people's comfort level. I mean, if you know how to create for your system, then I think a lot of people will fall into being like. As, from a designer's perspective, you're comfortable, you know the bones, you're like, I can reskin it in any way that I need to get my point across. Yeah, and I although... think that confidence level has definitely skyrocketed skyrocketed in that manner um, mm -hmm. with the kind of shift that uh, the 5e crowd has kind of made in the last few years, which is a lot of 5e players now um, consider themselves, consider it to be a narrative first game. Um, whether the whether that's actually supported by the system or not, it's the style of play that they like. And so from their perspective, Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition is their narrative first system. Um, and in order to do that, you kind of have to ignore a lot of the rules and you have to bend a lot of them. And so you end up getting into this pattern where you're like, oh, I can homebrew this into anything that I need to because as long as I'm rolling a d20 and determining whether you know I'm successful or not, the game works. And... You know, people have fun doing that, which is great, but that doesn't ignore the fact that there's a lot of systems that are trying to do what you would like to do a little bit better, and that kind of serve the purposes of your game a little better than 5th edition might. And I, I love 5th edition, there's nothing against it, and there's a, lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff it does well. Just like with Pathfinder, just like all these games, you know, have their strengths and their weaknesses, but, you know, I think the the default for a lot of especially newer 5e players that were brought in because of the actual play scene is thinking that 5th edition is a, a narrative-focused system. When really, that's just the style of play that your table has decided to utilize the system for. Yeah. Um, and for, for me, it's a case of... of, um, do, of when, it comes to that, when it comes to that particular claim, which I've heard, which I've heard for years, um, don't, it's, for me, it's a case of don't lie to me. <laughs> because <laughs> I... I'm I am well aware of the I am well aware of the asterisks involved, but I see it I see that kind of mindset more as a reflection of the the way the way people view the concept of fantasy. Um, I remember years ago see going on forums and pe and seeing people argue that Planescape, like the the Planescape from the '90s, was too weird to be considered fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> and the arg the argument that I the argument that I had is that it's it's only too weird to be fantasy if your fantasy if your idea of high fantasy begins and ends with Tolkien, and yeah. what we call the Tolkien melting pot. This uh, this idea that in order for something to be fantasy, it has to be that British Isles past medieval pastiche. Yeah. When ov obviously fa obviously fantasy can take a bu can take a bunch of different. Um, angles. One of the, I think, one of the reasons why um, Exalted was able to establish the footprint it did was because it specifically avoided uh, the Tolkien approach. Mm -hmm. um, it also, it was also, it also knew what also was a bit was a bit ahead of the curve by appealing to the weeb end of things. But <laughs> yeah. I'm, get, I'm getting it, ahead it, of myself. They nailed that demo before anybody else really jumped on it. And oh. it yeah. I remember when Tome of Battle came out, and I got a bunch of shit for def for defending it, because people would people would say that it was dipping into that it was too anime or too video or too video gamey and dipping into the toes of casters, even though casters were dipping their toes into everybody else. <laughs> but at the time, I had said, "You're gonna deal with a whole generation of players and G and GMs." Who did not grow up with Tolkien? Who did not grow up with uh, Moorcock? Who did not grow up with Howard? 
they they likely grew, they likely grew up with with Harry Potter or they likely grew mm-hmm. up with with the Slayers anime or yeah. they or they like or they likely grew up with the bevy of of fantasy adjacent um cartoons or e- or even the even stuff like Hercules and Xena yeah and the stuff that they end up making is going to reflect that the same way all the all the stuff that Tarantino makes is reflective of the kind of movies he grew up watching the the grind the grindhouse exploitation stuff and yeah that's a that's a great point and i i also think you're i think you're seeing a lot of that yeah i mean you're you're seeing all that come to fruition now with a lot of the things that are taking off and a lot of the i mean it I think a lot of your, uh, maybe it's just, I, I don't want to, again, I'm, I'll am i lose my nerd card, but like the, just the straight Tolkien-esque fantasy um, has never been definitely, has never been my favorite thing. Like, I like it, uh, but it feels like very well-worn, you know what I mean? Like, I, I can find enjoyment there, don't get me wrong, yeah. but I prefer something that feels a little more modern, that feels a little more uh, up-to-date. I don't. I I like Tolkien as much as the next guy, but I've but I've always resented the idea that that's what I have to do. Yeah. Um. Especially since the 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 approach that the approach that I've I have I have delved quite I have delved quite a bit into um, wuxia fiction mm. over over the years. It is it is a fascinating beast, and a lot and. A lot of the a lot of the motifs that you would that you would see with just casters doesn't really apply. Like if you look at a lot of wuxia themed games, like say Legends of the Wu Lin or Keen the Warring States, or um, or the old wep- or weapons of the or weapons of the gods or Kill the Buddha, um, its approach to magic is in the domain of alchemy and divination. What's what would be considered magic? You know, throwing the fireball or shooting lightning. That's just another form of kung fu, mm. and it. In I've co- a, f- a couple years ago, I covered a game called Against the Dark Yogi, which is obviously go- obviously going with um, Hindu myth, and there isn't the same reverence for for the same cultural reverence for the sword as you might find in something a, l- a little bit more European. Um, you yeah. look at a lot of you look at a lot of Indian myth, and it's the bow and the spear that have that have that sort of cultural footprint. So, the thing, the key thing is that fan, is that fantasy can take a bunch of different forms, and not all of them have to begin and end in the British Isles. I think that's the reason why um, why The Witcher ended up getting so po- so popular. There's a bunch of reasons, but chief among them is it being a fantasy that was more reflective of Eastern Europe and especially Poland. Yes, yeah, it definitely felt different. Uh, speaking of that, you've described Harrow as crystal punk. Yes, yeah. Now what? Now that is a term that c- that could certainly mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but for you, what does crystal punk entail? So I know there's. Uh, I, I'm going to put my cards on the table. I know that there's a large group of people that just slap punk on the end of things to make it sound cool. And um, I'm always a fucking sucker for slapping the word punk on the end of things. But crystal punk, <laughs> legitimately, uh, is a subgenre of fantasy. But um, it's, you know, it's a lot like it, it. Picture, you know, steampunk, but instead of gears and steam powering the world and any of its fantastical qualities, you're looking at crystals and their their inherent energies are responsible for any of the fantastic magical things that are happening or any of the things that you would you would see that are out of the ordinary or verging on like magitech or something like that is is powered by these crystalline energies Mm -hmm. um so that's sort of the the crux of the the crystal punk influence on horror yeah i i can get that no as an aside, I I have to keep calling it. I know I keep calling it Harrow, but that's oh, because cool. if I call it Haro, I'm gonna end up thinking of Gundam. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally cool. Uh, most yeah, I, honestly, it's like probably a sixty forty split of people who call it Harrow instead of Haro. So you're definitely not alone. <laughs> it's I, 
I guess I could chalk it up to the endless debate about how you pronounce the the image format known as um, graphics interchange format. <laughs> um, I I'm not ready that, for that kind of heated debate. Yeah, I've I've been I've been involved in it about whether or not you pronounce it with a G or a J or a J. Um, I I will admit the sole reason I pronounce it with a G is out of, is out of spite because <laughs> the creator of the format said it's pronounced with a J, and his reason is. Choosy programmers choose GIF. Boo. <laughs> so, in the in the words of Samuel Jackson, I've acknowledged that he's made a decision, but since it's a stupid ass decision, I've decided to ignore it. <laughs> but awesome. speaking of that, are you familiar with the concept of a appendix N? No. Oh. This was a thing that was that was in that was in some of the early D and D books, and it was basically a list of of ins of inspirational material, whether it was books, film, television, mm. yeah. mu music, etc. Um, what would be some of the things that would be in Harrow's Appendix N? Oh, that's amazing! Because honestly, it's like it is a beautiful gumbo of a lot of the things that I love, um, and that may not seem super apparent on on the surface. So. Off the bat, we like to say that it's, you know, there's a lot of treasure planet in there. Um, that was the inspiration for the, the Dune Leaper, which are the little boards that you see, like the single on, on the cover. You can see this lady on there zooming around in her goggles on the water sands. Um, mm -hmm. The treasure planet was I, I, I love treasure planet. You know, it's an underrated Disney cartoon to me. Absolutely love that one. So there's a lot of vibe of that in there. Um, a lot of that that feeling of like, you know freedom and discovery and exuberance and you know the the ships clearly being like a weird style of sail ship and stuff mm -hmm. um so that's there uh water world is in there um you, it's very apparent once you get into some of the like we the cultures of Haro are called the four nations that's the the, the four primary civilizations on Haro. um and you can see a lot of the water world um influence on the lacane armada uh, which is the, they're primarily this nomadic group of people that are just their way of surviving on Haro was just to f basically forever traverse the water sands on these massive village-sized sailing ships. But they'll also set up these things called drifts, which are floating islands, uh, basically, like floating villages. Um, definitely huge water world influence there. Um, also, the kind of there's mutants and things like that. Um, Dark Crystal is in the history, definitely. You could feel that there. Mm -hmm. Um uh, just a beautiful, basically all my favorite things from a lot of the po like because I love post apocalypse as a genre, but I definitely and I wanted to put that in here because it is a post apocalyptic setting. It's just in a post apocalyptic setting in a, in a high fantasy world. Um, so there's a lot from all of my favorite post apocalypse stuff. We we tried to squeeze squeeze in there because we both are huge fans of the genre, and then we were just able to put in a lot of the the very weird fantasy influences that we liked from like you know dark crystal and a lot of the hints and stuff and things like that yeah it'd be very interesting if you ended up make i've seen some people make a spotify playlist of some of the music that leans it's into that vibe that. yeah um like and i know max kakrisi has done has done that twice for the for both of the kickstarters re related to against the dark master and there's been a bunch of them for the main the main material related to mork borg just to, just to name a couple examples yeah um, and it's it is it is kind of funny that you bring that you bring up Waterworld, given the given the, um given the infamy with it with that particular film, um. It wasn't a bad film. It was just way too expensive for its own good. Yeah, like most of the Costner James back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. I until honestly until I got in this community, I um. I never met anyone that had like a positive opinion of Waterworld. Like if it ever came up, no one, no one ever had a nice thing to say about Waterworld. But I, I've always, you know, Keith and I both have always really, really loved it. So that had to go in there. Then, then again, as bad as bad as the room is, you still, you still see people going to midnight showings of that movie, um, dressed <laughs> as the characters in it, the way people would yeah. dress as characters from, uh, rock from Rocky Horror for midnight showings, as well as throwing toast. <laughs> oh, although I feel bad for anybody who dresses as Frankenfurter in a, in a midnight showing in January. Yeah, that's a you're a you're a pun intended ballsy individual to dress like Frankenfurter in January. <laughs> I've 
I've I've seen men, I've seen men and it doesn't I've seen men and women tr try it try it around that time of year and I'm like you are you are either very brave or very stupid or very drunk you get <laughs> one of those oh, that, one of those options. that too I'd be lying if I said I ha I've never had to fight somebody t when they wouldn't give when they wouldn't give up their keys <laughs> and then five minutes later it's like okay you can either you can either give me the, you can either give me your keys or you're or you're gonna pass out from the headlock and I'm just gonna take your keys anyways. <laughs> it's public service. Yeah. Either way, I'm get either way, I'm getting your keys. <laughs> but take now taking that into taking that into account. Um. One I remember one I remember one of the big pillars when C Cipher system was just Numenera. Uh, was an emphasis on exploration. Is that is that something that you guys have tried to you tried to carry through with Haro? Absolutely, and to and to be honest, that's one of the reasons one of the reasons why we picked Haro beyond you know being absolutely in love with it, you know, because and we're in love with all of our worlds, you know, mm -hmm. but um, so we each have our own little favorites. Haro was definitely one of. One of the ones that, you know, I absolutely love, Keith loves, you know, we, we love it dearly. But one of the things about it is it does have it, it, such an emphasis on exploration and discovery, which are the, which, like you said, big pillars in Cypher system. You know, you, you get experience points in Cypher not from killing things, but from discovery, new things, whether that's, you know new storylines for the actual campaign or actual literal things like you discoveries and exploration is kind of the name of the game um and haro has the opportunity all over the place not just because there's you know you, as the pcs in haro you take on the position of what are known as gatherers which you're the people who you go out and you brave the the wastes and the wilds of haro to bring back necessary materials for your nation um, so that might be, you know, buildings, what you would use for building supplies, things like that. Or it might be you went out and you found, you know, these miraculous treasures or whatever, and you're bringing them back either for your nation or for, for your own personal group, whatever that might be. But that's the role the PCs take on. So you're constantly in this position of going out and, and facing whatever Haro has to throw at you, which it might be, you know, all the crazy crystal blighted creatures that are out there. Or, you know, it could be some of the, the effects that come off of the waste, things like that. But um, there's also one of the things that Haro has in its in its bones is that it's it's a plane that has a lot of, like, planar tears and stuff that are affecting it because of the cataclysm um, that those people went through. Which, if you, go to, if you go to Spotify or go to the Kickstarter page, um, we have a, a really, really great... Uh, Three episode miniseries podcasts. Um, that's an audio fiction that dives into horror and explores both how it fell and also kind of people's perspective as an outsider to the plane, actually, you know, traveling through it. And it's uh, narrated by Joel Rigetti. Great story. Um, the last episode of it's about to come out like tomorrow or the next day. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's how you can kind of get into the the cataclysm part of it. But the too long didn't read version is because of how the plane fell. There's a lot of planar tears and planar effects. And so one of these things that happens is this phenomenon called that, you know, people kind of refer to as risen runes or, or risen islands, which is, you know, you'll have these things that will just rise up out of the water sands for either, you know, years or for days, you know, you never really know. And they introduce there. It's a great opportunity to introduce entirely new locations into the world um whether that be like a rune that your people discover and it's you get to do this like crazy dungeon crawl that maybe wouldn't have been in haro you know at its core but you found it outside of it and you wanted to put it in there to face your people or a new location like for instance there's no there's no cold places on haro but for all you know this island rose up and now there's this like little arctic area for the people to explore that's under the effect of some artifact or something so you, it gives you the opportunity to consistently introduce new things for for your players to discover and for the the people of the world to have to deal with um so even just in its both in the story of the world and at the actual the, the bones of the setting gives you the opportunity to always offer new things for people to to come across. Mm -hmm. So, with that in mind, I'd like to obviously go obviously going through a full list would be exhaustive, but I'd like to kind of hit a few highlights when it comes to the 
um, sent when it comes to the sentence-based creation of of cipher, as I've nicknamed it. Um, you know the whole the whole my character is an adjective noun who verbs thing. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'd let I will go I'll go through each part, and I'd like to I'd like to ask you for a few examples of the of the of each. Um, I was gonna say type, but each pillar for that's gonna be present in Haro. Yeah. And I'll I'll start with descriptor. We don't have to go through all of them. Just a few. Just a few that just a few that you happen to be fond of when it comes to the descriptor part of character creation. Uh, well, we have we have um a little over fifteen descriptors. Most of those are taken from the SRD and then reflavored to fit Haro. Um, and then we've created a couple of our own. Uh, Blightborn is one of my favorites, uh, which allows you to play this uh, mutant, basically, that's been affected by the Crystal Blight. Um, so that's a really great descriptor. And then, of course, Risk-Taking and al is always a big one. Um, Exiled has been a popular one with people um, mm -hmm. because there's an opportunity to play, like, an Exiled, you know, one of our species is, is called a Chrysalis, um, and they're, you know, people like to often play them kind of in the way that people play tieflings in D&D, &D, which is that they're kind of outsiders or whatever. So Exile's been a popular one there. Um, Lucky, Lucky's in there. It's always a popular one. Uh, so there, yeah, so there's a lot of descriptors. We, we include species in addition to descriptor. So instead of doing, I know in like in other, I think in base cipher, they offer you the option to have like a species instead of a descriptor. Um, but in Haro, you, you choose species and descriptor so you you kind of have an extended character sentence mm -hmm. yeah now next up would be t would be type um for the longest time there was there was just a basic three type that was your that was essentially your golden triangle of warrior rogue and mage no, ma no yeah. matter which version you used and then the then the advan then the um second char character book came along and we started getting three in betweeners yeah, um, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that you're st you're sticking to the basic six when it comes to types, or do you have some hero specific types? So what we have done for it, um, for our own ease, and because it fit the world, and for ease of entry, because we also kind of had to think about when we were creating Haro, we definitely wanted to think about it as being uh, our supporters' entry point into a new system, um, because we have. A lot of patrons and things who uh, support us who have only played 5th edition um, have never played the Cypher system. So when we looked at this, we were like, you know, this is going to be an outsider's introduction into the Cypher system. So, so how can we make this as uncomplicated as possible while still getting the coolness of Cypher across and also still being true to the world? Mm -hmm. So what we have is we have, we have three types as well. Um, and we have created a core set of abilities for each of those types flavored to Haro, and then you'll also get to pick additional abilities like as the standard in in your tier but it doesn't have the you're not going to be faced with picking between you know a thousand different abilities for your type you are kind of funneled into you get to pick you know two of these five choices basically that are explained to you as you go up in your tiers so for us, we have the Shriker, which is your your warrior. Mm -hmm. This is your your guy that's going around and facing all the all the the toughest, hardest stuff on Haro and doing it, you know, well. Um, we have the Rover, who is your your kind of your your token gatherer, your your ex your pulp explorer, your person that's going out and like mm -hmm. you're the person that gets to do all the roguey stuff in addition to being you know the this skilled type of individual. So the, and then we have the, the adept. Yes, yeah, C closer to that, yeah. And then we have the Blight Slinger, um, which would be the setting's closest thing to a magic user. Um, it's it's definitely more in theme, much more like a psionicist almost, than it is like uh, your traditional wizard or something like that. Um, because people in Haro don't really have access to like the arcane or the weave or things like that. You're basically, you're in a plane that's inundated with an energy known as the Crystal Blight. And what blight slingers are able to do is to is to manipulate that in a way that other people cannot. And it's a much more like tactile thing than just like reading a spell scroll or um, you know casting a spell like a sorcerer would do. 
it's so it's it's much closer almost to being like a psionicist in a sci-fi setting than it is to being a wizard in a fantasy setting mm -hmm. um so those are the three core types that we have in haro and um you've, we've got a few like baked in abilities that you get with them that we thought were important to those types as you navigate the world so like you know it, it makes sense that every blight slinger has some ability that allows them to focus on the crystal blight, but then they're also all going to be very different. We wanted to make sure that we allowed people that customization that we love so much about Cypher. So then as you proceed through the tiers, you get to pick like, you know, your, your abilities from a, from a pick list, but it's not, it, it doesn't have the same scope that like just having the Cypher system rulebook in your hand would. But the great thing about the Cypher system is if you do want to introduce something from the core book or from another Cypher setting into Haro, it's super easy because once, I mean, Cypher's like Legos. Once you know how to play it and everything kind of fits together. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm, I'm guessing that when it comes to, when it comes to the way Blight Slingers are um, portrayed in the, in setting there, be, being that being, being a set, being essentially a psychic or, or a psionicist, um, with when it comes to using their powers, at normal people and even and even some of their own companions might look at them a little bit sideways because they are playing with fire metaphorically and literally. Yeah, and honestly, fire is a really great way to describe blood because I mean, the people of Haro, you have to live with the the energy known as the crystal blight is what is responsible for every fantastical thing that happens in their world. Everything. Mm -hmm. Um, everything from the, the cool things that they get to utilize to help themselves to the terrible things that kill them, you know, out on the waste. So their, their view of it is, is very, I mean, it's very hypocritical in a lot of ways. Like if you're, if you're someone who was born and you're able to heal people because of your manifestation of the crystal blight, everybody's going to love you. If, if your manifestation of the crystal blight is much more destructive, um, then of course you might scare some people. The same thing as, you know, if you, if you're a blight born individual, so if you're someone who has a mutation either from birth or because you were, you know, influenced or influenced by something out in the world that mutated you, you know, you might get side eyes from people because, oh, they're worried. Are you going to, is this some sort of sickness that you can pass along to me? You know, if it's something very obvious Whereas if it's not very obvious or not, doesn't look very threatening, people might be, you know, they'll, it's a live and let live kind of scenario. So mm -hmm. it's definitely very much like, very much like a humanity's relationship with fire in that, you know, it is a fantastic and horrible thing at the same time. It can be responsible for civilization spiking and it can be responsible for everything burning to the ground. So yeah, if you're, if you're a blight slinger, depending on how you carry yourself, depending on how your manifestation it, kind of is in the world, uh, pretending on, you know, where you're at located in the world, you could be anything from, you know, people's like, oh, this person is a miracle worker to this person is dangerous and I don't want them near my children. So, mm -hmm. so now I get the feeling that there, that there were a lot of, um, a lot of, spe a lot of specific abilities that a lot of setting specific abilities you added in when it comes to the focus pillar. Um, what would be a few, what would be a few examples of standouts? Um, and with the, the another back to the the great thing about what Monty Cook Games has done with the the CSRD a lot. I mean, they've included so many foci in the SRD that we we have created our own. But the majority we have a, we have over twenty foci in in there to choose from. Um, the and some of them we have just retailored to fit Haro itself. So one that stands out to me. Oh, what is it? I want to say, what is it? Is it Clint? Something of the obelisk or something. Um, I can't remember. It's a focus that essentially it, it lent itself very well to this world with very little retooling because it basically turns you into this crystalline being. Um, and that was something that, given the history of the setting that we have, we just had to basically retool the lore and retool a little bit of the abilities and it fit perfectly. And now it's, you know, claimed by the triad, which the triad were these. You know, this, these three giant crystals that used to hang in the skies of Haro before they were destroyed, and that's what led to the Cataclysm. Um, mm -hmm. And they were kind of looked like, they were looked at as, as kind of like deities to the people of Haro before they were destroyed. Um, so that's one of the instances. Another one is, um, I think Drives Like a Maniac is the normal focus in Cypher, but we rebuilt it to be tears across the sands, and it basically makes you this amazing 
skimmer. So if you're out on your on your dune leaper or you're out, you know, on your on your sand ship, you're able to do all these really fucking cool tricks out there and be like the person that's zooming around on the water sands around all the raiders and stuff. Um, so a you know, a lot of it was us just retooling the the core foci, and we do have we we have a couple that we've created in there. But to be honest, the the what they had available to us with just little changes, we were able to utilize. So we decided to include those in the book. Yeah, um, I do re I do remember when I w when I was doing a when I was doing the, my um my Numenera campaign, one of the one of the foci that was that was you that was used was ride was ride the light was rides the lightning. Yes. <laughs> or, yeah. It's or it's equivalent. Basically, we had one person who had some circ well, had some circuitry mixed in with his body, and because of that, he he was a living dynamo. Because um, I was I was embracing the fact that Numenera is supposed to be weird and yeah. trying to and trying to argue about whether Numenera is sci-fi or whether it's fantasy is missing the forest for the trees because I've always described it as this is what happens when someone takes Clark's law on both ends of the spectrum and puts it to its logical extreme. <laughs> the, the, the reason why I say both ends is because everybody knows Clark's law as any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. That's one side of the coin. There's another side that isn't as brought up as, as much but really should. Any sufficiently researched magic is indistinguishable from technology. <laughs> yes. And with because of because of the because of the nature of the of the crystal blight, I'm guessing that there is a bit there is a bit of that embrace the weird when it comes to Harrow. Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, it's funny if you look at the the other side, like you were just talking about. Um, the the dynasty that ruled over Haro before the cataclysm was ruled by the, this this race of beings known as the Kataria, and they were kind of at the end of that spectrum that you just spoke about, where they were so in tune with like transmutation magic and had such powerful artifacts and things that you know they verged on being indistinguishable from technology. Um, very, very magitech in what they had access to and what they used to transform the world and the people that lived in it. Um, so after they caused the cataclysm and the world fell, uh, you know, you lost the bulk of all that. But you can still find these pieces of, you know, what what are referred to as Kataria tech or, you know, artifacts or anything like that. But th that's a, that you can still find those out in the world. And they'll have, you know, they'll they'll be... The people of Haro consider them, you know, to be just another manifestation of the crystal blight. It's it's magic. It's you know, it is what it is. Um, but from the from the player perspective at the table, it's definitely you're finding these things that are it's verging on the technology. It's verging on you know, it, it's getting to the weirdest you know edge of fantasy that you can get without suddenly popping over onto that sci-fi side. Mm -hmm. um, so you can find pieces of that there. Yeah. Um, and you can use them. And, you know, some it's it's fun because, you know, j people don't know what these things are. They just, you know, they know what they're there and they know that they can use them for these things and they, they might be using them in a way that was never intended by the Kataria, but it's how they've, they've decided they're going to utilize them. So there's definitely that there. Yeah, that's the other thing. A lot... With Numenera, a lot of the ciphers were um, were pe were pieces of technology that were repurposed. And as far as what the original use was, some t sometimes people know what it was. Sometimes people have no clue. Sometimes it's a case of we have no idea how it works, but it but it works. So yeah, so <laughs> exactly. Uh, I remember I remember when somebody when somebody asked me, could, could you figure out how it works?" and I said. When you when you hire a carpenter to fix your house, do you ask them what kind of hammers they use, or do you <laughs> do you, or do you care about what kind of hammers they use, or do you care about the th about the about the fact that they're trying to fix your house? Yeah, it's this it's the same cut it's the same kind of principle. Um, I think a, a lot of pe as much as I keep picking on um, Bethesda the the age old phrase from Todd Howard the living mop, um, it just works <laughs> definitely applies. When yeah. It, now, back in back in Numenera and 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 several other cipher approaches, 
there there's always been a limit to how many ciphers someone can have safely um in in numenera they had they had it they had a rule and i think as also with um the strange there were certain interesting things that could that could run the risk of happening if you had too many if you had too many over your limit to the point to the point where you could the worst case scenario is you end up losing your character through some sort of catastrophe Mm -hmm. um, do you have do you have something similar if somebody goes over the limit with with ciphers or their equivalent in haro we do um it's it's less uh it's less like a, a bunch of crazy different things that could happen and more that um so from a from a, a world approach the the crystal blight can be treated a lot kind of like like a, a radiation so um if you have too much of this in one space if you're carrying too many ciphers on yourself you'll start to get sick essentially so you can catch something that the people of horror refer to as a lingering blight um if you have them for too long so when you first when you first have you know when you're over your cipher limit essentially you'll just start getting sick it will hinder your actions things like that mm -hmm. but um you know if you if you haven't ditched them after a certain threshold then you you get a lingering blight and lingering blight is it's it's can be looked at kind of like a, a radiation sickness basically um and you have to go to some lengths to get rid of it Lingering Blight you can catch just by, you know, being too close to the wrong thing while exploring things in Haro. There are certain creatures that can give you Lingering Blight. Thing, like, basically things that are incredibly toxic, for lack of a better word, that are so inundated with this energy that it becomes poisonous to you as a normal being, um, can give you a Lingering Blight. And that's, that's kind of how we've expressed that cipher limit. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to get rid of it, you know, eventually, either by, you know, there's... The people of Haro have created this tincture that is called Purge because of the the effect that it has on your body and because it does get rid of the lingering blight. So you have to go through several days of doing that yourself um, if you're out without a blight slinger or if you are able to get to a blight slinger that has that specific ability to remove levels of lingering blight, then you can get rid of it that way. But yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, a, a for lack of a better word, it's like a magical radiation sickness that you can get and that we will have different effects on you as you're trying to navigate the world. Um, now, t with all with all that in, with all that in mind, one one particular thing that has gotten a bit of discussion is how fast and loose um, Cipher has played with with the concept of skills. Yeah. Within Haro, do you have a do you, do you have something akin to a list of suggested skills? We do again because you know we were we were looking at this as we're designing for people who may not have had experience with the system before, mm -hmm. um, which is why um, we included all the all the core rules are in the book. So you don't need to have another book to be able to play. You can play in Haro, and then you'll know how to play every other cipher game essentially. But um, we we knew that you know especially coming from games like. Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or something, which have much more, you know, robust rules for their skills and such that people might find it a little. And that was when we were first playing in our home games, that was probably the, the hardest thing for people at the table to really overcome was that concept of, you know, how loose the skills kind of are in Cypher. So we definitely had like that suggested list of skills, which are just like, you know, we have like the, the basic rules for the skills, which are, you know, basically anything can be a skill if you put your mind to it. Um, but also, here's a list of skills that you're probably going to come across people in Haro having. So you might want to utilize these. And we, and we reference those throughout the text, just for simplicity's sake. You know, you're if you're if you're trying to fix something, you know, you're gonna you're gonna roll tinkering roll most likely. If you're trying to you know go out and scavenge, you're gonna roll a scavenge roll. So I mean, we've we've got all that normal stuff there, and we've got the rules so that people understand like. You know, it's if you if you want one of your blight slinger abilities to be a skill, you can do that. Um, but you know, for for the people coming in from other more robust skill based systems, that we have that list there. Yeah, and I'm guessing that e even though even though the way the way um the way cipher system handles we handles weapons is pretty sim is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. You know, your your light, medium, and heavy melee and, ra and ranged weapon approaches. Um, how? I'm guessing that I'm guessing that you still that you still have a weapon list to to 
to account for what would, what would be considered the standard weapons and armor, as well as the more setting specific types of equipment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we definitely we have the equipment list in there because that was another thing that um that was just in. To, to be fair, we, we don't ever play in anyone else's settings or anything, so when, when we introduced Cypher System in our home games, our playtest games, it was not through an established setting like Numenera or something, it was through the core rules and our settings. Mm -hmm. um, so equipment was definitely one of those things that people also kind of felt was a little too loose. Again, because you're used to coming from games like D&D or Pathfinder, which have those very, you know strict equipment um, lists and things like that. So we definitely included a, a lot of unique items that we would consider standard to, to fantasy, but that would still fit in Haro because not everything's going to be there. Um, it wouldn't make sense for the world itself to be able to like find this beautiful, you know, massive shining metal shield because, you know, th you're probably not going to be able to get that sort of quality of metal or that type of material mm -hmm. in Haro very often unless you happen to find something special out, you know, in the waste or whatever. Um, so we, and then we have like the, the very cool Haro specific equipment that people have in the world. Um, and that includes like special materials um, that includes weapons and armor that includes the sand ships. Um, mm -hmm. We have a backer goal set up for, to include sand ship customizations, which would also be in there so that you can, customize and outfit your sand ship with different things that might m make navigating the world easier, make your armament better, or things like that. Uh, so we, we do have a, a special Haro equipment list and special materials list that people can play around with. Um, something that we did keep because of the world itself, which I think people are going to find probably the, the most jarring from a character setup perspective is that, you know, we do the relative pricing um, because Haro operates, the whole world runs on trade. There's no standard currency. It is. It, it's a barter system. Everything mm -hmm. works that way. So it just the 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 original way of you know things are inexpensive, expensive, etc. Fit really well into this world because that that is how people look at it on a day to day basis. And things might flex a little bit depending on what area you're in, whether or not this thing is more valuable in this nation or in this nation. But because it is trade, there there's no set currency, so you can't say you know this is going to cost a hundred gold or whatever. It's, you know, you're doing that bartering back and forth. So we did keep that. I think that's the most non-standard thing that people might come into. Um, but we have, like, a little descriptor that, you know, kind of lays out and explains to the GM, like, how how to kind of get people into this mode and how to, you know, do the, the trade. Because not everybody is used to doing that in character in game, you know. But we, we have the, the, the item lists have their expected value next to it. So people can utilize those to, to do the trades. Yeah. I do remember. I do remember when I had to hammer home how th how um somehow you couldn't j you couldn't just use a universal currency with with one of the campaigns I was in. Um, oddly enough, I ended up I ended up referencing, of all things, Watto from from Phantom Menace. <laughs> so, public credits are no good around here. I need something more real. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you have a gold bar, someone's going to think that's pretty, definitely, but it's like, I can't feed my kids that tomorrow, you know, and if it, it we, we, one of the examples we use is one of the four nations, the Carabundi, has access to a lot more, like, agricultural resources than other nations do, and they kind of provide that, so, uh, you know, a, a basket of glop eggs aren't going to mean as much to them as it would be to someone in the Lacan Armada who do, they don't have access to those exact same resources. So you also have that flexibility as the GM to, to kind of show people the value of these things is, is, is malleable and it shifts from area to area in the world. And I think that's a really cool way to, to kind of express things in the setting. Yeah. Now with that, with that in mind, I'm. I've always said that the that the cipher system is one system that is a natural fit for hex crawls. If you're familiar with that with that mm -hmm. concept, and I'm curious if you have plans on putting some sort of event table for for exploration. We we have um. So what we have for each of the major areas that we detail out the um. 
because since there is this concept that you know you you might stumble across these small islands that are very different or whatever uh we we've tailored out the um an area called the great oasis which is like the major wilderness area basically that people get to explore and any of the smaller oases that you might find floating around out in the water sands are going to emulate that in some fashion. So we've, we've, we've done that. And then we have like the Lucent Wastes, which is a very different environment. Um, and we have crystal blight effect tables for each of these different areas. Mm -hmm. So if the GM wants to throw a curveball at people, you know, they have those random, random crystal blight effect tables that can cause a variety of different phenomenon to occur. Um, they, depending on which area you're at, you know? Um, so we have those for each of the major um, explorative, uh, ex exploration areas for the world. And then you can utilize those, you know, depending on if, if you're having people just, you know, flesh out, you know, uh, an environment that's incredibly different to the ones that are, you know, introduced in the core book, then you might have to get a little creative. But we do have several different tables for people to use, to, you know, to their mm -hmm. heart's content. And what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the book? Um, depending on what we unlock via stretch goals. I mean, we have all the core rules and stuff in it. We're, we're probably going to be in the vicinity of 200 pages, I would guess. Um, we may in, end up being a little more. We tried to be um, very... This is our very first full setting book. This is also our first full Kickstarter um, and this was our introduction to an entirely new system and to a an entirely new section of the community. So we tried to be as as conservative as we could be with as passionate as we were because, like, I mean, if we had our druthers, this would be, you know, <laughs> this would be the size of Tolus. But, you know, we don't have Tolus clout yet or a Tolus budget. So we had, to, we had to really kind of pare it down and go, what is, what is the core of Haro? What is going to allow people to explore this world and tell these stories and do all the rad shit in it that we've all been able to do what can we what goes in the core book and then what do we have to go okay this will be one of the supplements that we're able to release in the future to to further things you know going forward so we have the core book and then we have a ton of materials that we have kind of waiting in the wings after the core book's been produced to then release the supplementary materials on drive through or something that will mm -hmm. further flesh out um, the four nations, the you know the the different areas, add in new new islands or things because you know some people love to be able to go crazy and create their own things and drop them in there, but then some people are like you know I I would actually don't have an idea for something cool and new to add to Haro. Why don't you give me that? So we're always there for those people too. But yeah, so the core of Haro will have everything that you need. But for instance, if we like, if we're not going to hit our stretch goal to be able to put the sand ship customizations in for for this book, you know, mm -hmm. that's fine. We can release that as a supplement, you know, in the future with a lot of the other equipment and things like that that didn't, didn't make it into the core book. So mm -hmm. the materials are there. Um, we just had to kind of be as from a production standpoint because we are just, you know, it's just me, Keith, and we just onboarded um, Kayla, it's just the three of us and then whatever artists we hire on. So we're a, we're a super small crew and we we have, you know, we're working on that indie shoestring budget. So we had to kind of like temper what our, our passion wanted us to put into that book to make sure that what we put out in front of people is a very high quality and very uh, coherent, you know, setting book. Mm -hmm. And I'll certainly be looking forward to it. Since you mentioned that it's just you three, I have to ask the question, which one of you is Mo? which one of you is Larry, which one of you is Curly? Oh, man, that's tough. And I feel like it kind of shifts from day to day, to be quite honest with you. It depends on the situation. <laughs> because, like, it, depending on which one of us are, like, g going off the rails that day, I would have to say probably the standard. I would say Kayla's the Mo that we needed just because she's very good at, like, kind of reining us in. Because Ke Keith and I are massive dreamers, you know what I mean? And we're both, like very creative people, which Kayla is too. That's not to deter from that at all. But she's also the person that is like, hey, you can't fucking make this like a 500 page book. That doesn't make any sense coming out the gate, you know? So she's the Mo. Um, I'd say I'm the, I, I would say I'm the Larry and Keith the Curly. But again, those shifts back and mm -hmm. forth. Yeah, <laughs> usually, usually, with two, usually with two person crews, I always end up asking who's the Abbott and who's the Costello. Um, <laughs> and I use the Three Stooges for three person crews. Um, <laughs> 
And of course, in in some ca in some cases, if I feel like being annoying, I usually ask who's the tank. Oh my gosh! Yeah, thankfully no tank here. <laughs> no, no, no. Who is the tank? Who's the tank? Yeah. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love I love doing that on people. <laughs> <laughs> no, no offense. I do it. To, I do it to everybody. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 basically it's basically an RPG version of the of the old who's on first. You know? Who's on first? Yeah. You no, know, who's That's who's great. the tank? What's the mage? I don't know. Was the priest? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yesterday's yesterday's the rogue. I don't care. Is the paladin? Uh. I feel like that would do numbers on Twitter if you put that out. I feel like people would really bite into that right now. Oh, uh, I've um. I originally I originally found it because somebody did it on as this as this old ass um World of Warcraft machinima in the early days of YouTube. And it's one of those things I can always go back to if I need a laugh. Cuz yeah. you have two you have two guys essentially doing the whole skit just just replacing the baseball positions with World of Warcraft classes. <laughs> um apparently it was even a hit it, apparently it was even a hit with the people making the game. Which That's is That's all which is understandable because who's on first is one of those universal things. You don't even have to be a baseball fan to appreciate it. That's true, and it's it's weirdly it, it's carried so far forward too in the zeitgeist, which is crazy. Like I see Tumblr kids talking about it still, and I'm like, you're 12, but you know, people still know it. Yeah. Uh, sometime, sometime, some sometimes thing. Some there's the there's the there's the old thing of of. Of how of how of how eventually old jokes get, get phase out of style. No, they just they just they just resurface in new ways. Yes. Oh. And someone thinks that they're that like some new kids like oh I just discovered the most hilarious new thing and it's like well that's actually not so new but mm. congratulations. <laughs> yeah. But I will certainly be looking forward to seeing what to seeing um, Harrow as well as well as whatever else you guys have planned. As you as you venture into the weird and one and wonderful cool. world outside outside of the, um, the mo the world's most litigious role playing game, <laughs> <laughs> and with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. No, I appreciate you having me on. Seriously, like mm -hmm. a very rad time. Mm -hmm. You run a, you run a you run a cool show. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>